All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful Sunday afternoon, although I, I'm not sure where everyone else on screen is at right now, so it might not be the afternoon or even Sunday, um, knowing me. Um, well, but thank you so much for joining us for um, this event about Fragile Threads of Power. Um, and today we're having an extra special event because we're joined by the audiobook narrators of the Fragile Threads of Power. Um, so let's see, brief, brief introductions of everyone. Of course, we've got um, Victoria V.E. Schwab, New York Times bestselling author of so many books. Um, <laughs> we've got Kate Reading, who is um, a very prolific audiobook narrator across many genres. It's got, Reading. What was that? It's Reading. I think, oh no, I, I usually ask. And <laughs> it came up, I was like, I didn't ask. Um, I'm more also, confident than the audio narrator. Trust an audio narrator. Trust uh, audio narrator. Like, wait, we got to do this from. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've also got Michael Kramer, um, who's in his fourth decade of audiobook narration, and Marissa Kalin or Callen? Marissa Kalin. Um, who's an actress, screenwriter, and novelist. Um, so we have just uh, like a murderer's row of pros here. <laughs> pro, pro, pros, pros. Um, there's a pun there. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we've got lots of questions, so let's get into it. All right, um, so for V, I'd love to know, how do you feel returning to the Shades of Magic series with this new book? Um, how did you choose where to pick up and um, how did you choose where to go, I guess? Um, I mean, it, it's always felt like coming home. I knew that's how I wanted it to feel when I was writing it. It's how I wanted it to feel while people read it. I uh, don't do anything lightly. I am very much a planner. So by the time I started writing the first book in Shades of Magic, I knew the ending of the third. I don't set off lightly, but about halfway through Conjuring of Light, I knew... I started to feel a nostalgia for a world I wasn't even done with yet. That was a first for me. And then a plot point presented itself that I could have either wrapped very quickly or I could have used it as a tiny door to hinge open in case I ever wanted to come back. And I chose the latter. And so I decided to come back seven years later because I think from a symbolic point of view, seven years is enough time for us to kind of begin anew we regenerate ourselves, right? It's enough time though for children to become teens and teens to become young adults and young adults to become adults and worlds to change in noticeable ways. And so hence the seven years, I also guessed it would take me seven years to come back. It took me six from a publication standpoint, but seven from a writing standpoint. And I wanted my characters to be able to grow along with me. So I didn't feel like I was returning to a past version of myself. I didn't want it to feel like I was writing fan fiction of something that I wrote in my 20s now that I'm in my 30s. And so, yeah, I gave myself the breadth and the time to come back, but it meant we had a lot of ground to cover when I did. And we get some new characters like Tess, which um, is one of my favorites in all of your, uh, your series. So that's super exciting. We'll probably talk more about it, but um, for all the narrators, I would love to know how you got into audiobook narration and what drew you to um, this series? I don't know how we're gonna do this. Let's just start with um, uh, Marissa. Uh, I trained as an actor um, and I always knew that I also wanted to be a part of creating material because otherwise you're just waiting for some, something to come along. So the first thing I did out of drama school was to write a novel. Um, and that was published by Bloomsbury. And then I had some friends in uh, the publishing world and they knew I was an actor and they asked me to do an audio book, no, um, a, a trailer, a book trailer. Um, and in the process of that, they asked me if I did long form and I didn't, but I said I did. And then I did the audio book of that. Um, and that was 12 years ago at least. And it was Macmillan. And because it married my love of acting and uh, literature in it, uh, and it was just the perfect corner of the sandpit to end up in and I've been doing it ever since. Michael? Uh, did a little bit of training as an actor uh, but I'm also a, a theater artist kind of wide-ranging director, stage manager, a little bit of sound design. 
uh, a friend of mine was doing audiobook narration back in the days of reel to reel and cassettes and needed an engineer. And so for four years, I was his engineer and then three other narrators. And then the head of the studio saw me in a play and said, you need to be on the other side of the microphone, um, pushed me to audition and, uh, got hired by two companies and kind of never turned back. So yeah, enjoy it. If you told me when I was 12 years old that I was going to make my living reading books, I would have been over the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I, I just, we go on a vacation and it's, I've got a book in my hands. So reading is just such a part of my life. I mean, when you put it that way that you get paid to read books, that is a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Kate? Um, so also started out in theater and pretty early on after I moved to Washington DC, I was doing theater and waiting tables and uh, joined the Woolly Mammoth Theater Company and one of my colleagues, who's also a friend of Michael's, Grover Gardner, who was in the company, said, you should come work at the Library of Congress. So they have a wonderful program for people who are print disabled or blind called the Talking Books Program. And um, they have a studio for uh, recording audiobooks in Northwest DC. So I applied for a job and I got hired as an engineer, worked as an engineer for a year, and then was accepted as a narrator, started narrating there and then sent some demos out and got picked up by a couple of different companies um, and started working commercially. And that was in, that was in the sort of mid late eighties. The Pleistocene era of <laughs> audiobooks. Or, the tech it's has a little easier to get the audiobooks now. Yeah, right. yeah. hugely so. Yeah. And the so, Library of Congress program now has an app. So oh, you used awesome. to have to order from a catalog and you would get these chunky boxes of cassettes that you were put in your special player and now you have an app on your phone and the books are downloaded yeah. to your phone so how do you all decide which project to take on um and related why did you guys decide to um work on this book well anytime you have a chance to work with a writer like the Schwab, you don't say no <laughs> Yeah, I was I was gonna say that it the the writing the writing makes everything just easy. It was this was one of the easiest books I've ever recorded. It was it was probably the easiest, and it's not the subject matter is a small piece of it. I love historical fiction. I do a lot of that, but um, I think when you pick up a book and you trust the writer right away, you know you're just in for. All you have to do is inhabit it. You don't have to sort of unpack it as you go along you just have to live it and good writing is just a gift in that way there's nothing more for you to do than just experience it and yeah, yeah. and you know that as soon as you pick up a text yeah. well thank you i also just want to say from my perspective so early on in my career i didn't get to have any say in narrators even in seeing a short list or or everything but we were talking in the green room before this started about the impact that audiobook can have in our lives as readers too. Um, Matt and I specifically were talking about that. And like, the thing is that back when Shades of Magic was getting narrated, I was listening to Sanderson and Brennan and listening to these, you know, these books, uh, History of Dragons and, and The Way of Kings. And just you, when you find narrators that you love, you then they become the voice in your head for fantasy, right? And so um, Kate and, and, and Michael became this voice in my head. And I, and then I had this luxury when they came up on the list of people we could ask to see if they would do Shades of Magic. And I was like, oh my goodness, but they're the voice in my head for, for fantasy right now. And so that was such an incredible gift because it was like getting to continue a trusted voice in my head and also to feel like to see as an audiobook listener to have narrators that you love then working with your own material feels incredible. And then when it came time, to cast Tess and to have a new voice enter this world um, and this recording series, I was very, very lucky that I got to have a say in it. 
And as soon as I heard Marissa, I was like, I want her. Like I just, and it's so weird because obviously there's technical acumen, there's technical, <laughs> but as an, as an author, there's simply the fact that we hear our characters in certain ways. And, and then I will listen to three or four narrators and they're all stellar, but I will hear the one that is the voice in my head. And so I think it was just, it's such an incredible luxury when the voice in your head matches up with what you are able to actually, like the people that want to work on it. And so it's just been such a gift to have, to have the three of you bringing these stories to life in such specific and nuanced and wonderful ways. Uh, Marissa mentioned, you know, being lucky to work with this quality of writing. And I'm curious, V, from your perspective, if, um, you know, obviously there's a gap between when you write it and when you, when it gets recorded and then when you hear it, do you ever hear, um, you know, things that you wrote where you get like the chills and then, and like it surprises you or, and on the opposite end, are there ever things that you write where you're like, I'm so embarrassed or like nervous that someone has to read that? Uh. No, I mean, I like it. I think it's great. I think so you have to understand also I'm a I'm the kind of writer who has an entire section of my revision process where I read the, the work out loud to myself as I go to make sure that the prose works in an oral format as well as a written format because I think so often what works on the page doesn't work on the ear and a lot of my stories I want them to have a specific cadence my backgrounds in poetry. So I think meter and rhythm I need to know that all the dialogue sounds like dialogue when it's spoken. So I test run kind of everything auditorily and orally. And so I, I think I'm prepared for it to be read aloud. My main concern is not about embarrassment or anything. It's just really making sure that it, it sounds like a story in the ears as well. Do you ever get surprised by what you wrote? By you listening to other people? Never in a positive way. Very early on in my career, I'm surprised <laughs> in a negative way. Only because early on in your career, when you don't really have any say, there's no, um, like, like Marissa and Kate and Michael know this, we, like, we will create, like, uh, audio documents that say pronunciation guides and things like that. Well, early on in my career, I, I didn't have that luxury. There were no pronunciation guides. I would be told, you're so lucky to have an audiobook, which I was. Here's the finished audiobook. And no one had checked me for any pronunciation. And so there would be really basic, weirdnesses that were just not technically wrong but not how I would have ever heard something and that will throw me out of a book but in terms of being drawn in uh, I just feel like it's a gift like having great narrators is a gift and the thing is I look really to the readers and the listeners because I am so close with the material and I've lived with it for so long that I don't necessarily have the surprise factor but what I love is hearing from readers when they're like oh, this narrator brought it to life or this scene sounded so great because to me, I'll always have the weight of having written those scenes. I can't listen to it purely as a reader. Um, and so I kind of have to lean on my, my own audience to tell me when things are really wonderful for them. I just feel joyful when I listen to something and it sounds like a book and not like something that I wrote. I need the cognitive discipline. So I'm curious, um... You know, for the narrators, there's a um, there's a lot of characters in this book, and they're all very complex and and well grounded. Um, how do each of you approach kind of creating the voices? And you know, this is also a like book that jumps around in time, so there's a lot there's a big you know variety of emotions that these people are at in their lives. Um, so can you walk us through the process of actually giving life to these characters? We'll start with Kate. I'll go. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was that was lucky. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like you do your pre-read of the book. So you read the book entirely for yourself. Uh, okay. There's a pop-up window. Um, just... Can I get rid of it? <laughs> Um, I'll get rid of it, don't worry. Thanks. Sorry, distracting, visually distracting. So you you, you do the pre-read of the book and you absorb the story like you know, without thinking, oh, I'm going to be voicing these characters. You're just taking the story in and you're learning who these people are and what they want and how, what the arc of the book is. And you have your 
pronunciation sheets, whatever the sort of tech support stuff is that you've been provided with. You do all that prep. And then you get in the booth and you open your mouth and you start reading and you're just inhabiting in real time, sort of forgetting that you you both know and you don't know. It's a little schizophrenic. So you hang on to the knowledge at a distance, but it's there to support you because you're riding the wave, you're in the moment, you're like switching characters, you're following the plot and the twist and the blah, blah, as though you're experiencing it for the first time. And that way it's sort of, it's fresh and it's alive and you allow yourself to be surprised in the same way the reader is surprised. Um, and <laughs> not to like overly lard you with praise, V, but, when the writing is good, when you trust the writing, you really do just open your mouth and the right sound comes out because it's all there in the writing. What about you, Marissa? Do you have the same process? Or yeah, yeah, I was gonna say this, the same. Um, I make, I, I read it through and I usually to wait for the moment to come and then I'm making sure I'm placing people in different places so I have some distinction, but I don't overthink that. I'll sometimes write a little, no um, if it's in the text, I'll make a note of it. So I'll do a lot of, I tend to throw in a lot of regionalisms just so that they're distinguished, but I don't want to do that too much if it's not specified. But I always have to listen to, I, I make terrible notes for this very same reason. Kate, I think I rarely hear people say that. I hear a lot of people say they make their distinct choices ahead of time, but sometimes it just doesn't feel right in the moment. So I will always have to go back and listen to all my characters because I'll get to a sequel and I'll be like, ah, oh, I don't have anything to tell me what I did. <laughs> for the smaller stuff, for the peripheral things. I always, yeah. the, the, the main characters have, I've tended to sort of really take on board. So they, they live, I, I know who they are. So I wouldn't forget them, but otherwise I go with the flow. Um, if it's yeah, if it's in the text um, specifically where they're from, their socioeconomic background, I make sure I do write by all of those things because, especially in British books, that's sometimes a lot of uh, a key piece of the story. Uh, so I, I make sure I'm, I follow all the clues and do what what we're told is happening. But otherwise, yes, I love just to see where they come from as I go. Can I just say? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I love that all three of you, though, seem to be of the same school in that, because I think that to me as a listener, that that's what keeps it exciting. Mm -hmm. What keeps it exciting is the sense that you have a momentum. And I think sometimes what can happen, some just sometimes, is if narrator is overly familiar with what they're doing and it sounds like work, it takes up a kind of monotony because it's something that is not as refreshing or as fresh and as surprising to them as it will be to the reader and I think that that is one of the like especially in fantasy especially with, with longer books I think that can be a really great disservice in the long run because it becomes rote mm -hmm. and so I think that one of the things that I love about listening to all three of you is that it does feel like we have a momentum behind the words like we're tripping along and we're gaining momentum along with you so sorry right. I just wanted to say I think it's great no, if I can just agree with the reason why I think that is, is because if you've made a choice about a character voice as being in a certain place or uh, a character trait, like a dirgy voice, you lose, you don't play the scene. So if you get too caught up in the idea of what the character should sound like, then that's what you're doing rather than allowing two people to react to each other. And I think that's that can be that can hold you back from actually just having two. So if two people are talking, they need to sound a little different but you don't want to think too much about the traits and more really just about what's happening and what's being said. And it can, yeah, if you play it by ear, that, that helps, I think. And so much of the time, it's so much more about their intention. Right. Right? Yes. And I wanted to ask you, Marissa, and I, I think I know what the answer is. Do you find that the reason you hang on to the voices of the bigger characters is because they're in your body? Absolutely. There's a, I was, yes, physically, uh, yes, because I've interpreted them differently than just making choices about them. Yeah. And again, I'm going to do the same thing, but good writing, mm -hmm. it's in there. They're distinct. And if their voice is distinct, the character is distinct without you having to load something super specific on top of that. Yeah. Already they're expressing themselves differently. So yes, they, they I, I go back right into where I, who they are because if they are written in a, in, if they're fleshed out, then you've done, you've done all the work already. 
And there's yeah. one little like nerdy technical detail that people not, might not be aware of. When you have these characters, like they are in this book, who are like, they are like forward charging. You have to wear very quiet clothing. Yes. <laughs> because if you start moving around and you're wearing, you know, poplin or something, you're just going to pick up all this noise. Yeah. I, can I ask a question? Because I'm just deeply curious. Like when writing, often there's like little hacks or little ways to like give yourself, get yourself in the zone, right? A lot of writers will have like music that they listen to. Or a lot of writers will have like specific environments or beverages or anything like that um, to get into a scene. Like I use a specific like song usually per character to get into the zone. But obviously as you're narrating, you don't have a luxury. Do you have like totem? I know you have booths, but like inside the booth, is there like a totem or anything that helps you move between characters' perspectives? Oh, Michael. Well, no, sometimes sometimes I will, if I know like I'm going to be coming into a certain scene, there's the, what's, what's the underscoring, the music underscore of it. And I will listen to that ahead of time. And then, okay. You know, I've just put on Pulse the Planets and we have the war. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Moment. Like, we're like, what happened? What? Oh, my goodness. Oh. Okay. What, while we're waiting for them. Marissa, do you? Can I, yes, I'll fill the space, but and we'll come right back to him. Um, yes, I don't have my own booth. I work in studios in New York City. Um, but I, I'll often have come up with music that is, so it's my preparation time is going to the, to the studio. So I did a book. Um, I always think of this because it was such a specific choice for me. Um, and it's hard, it, you get off the subway and you have to hold on to the vibe you've just struck, even though you still have to get there. I would go to the very front of the subway car and I would go into the first carriage where there's the driver is to the side. So the window looks at the track and I would play pirates of the Caribbean in my headphones. And I would stand at the front of the subway, like the subway car, like I was, yeah, I was on my ship, and I would then try and like take that dun 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 dun, dun right <laughs> into the, and then it would, and then you kind of got to get situated, but it would, it would, it would give me the pace that I needed. This book was full of adventure and fights, and I was, and I wanted that pace, and I wanted that sense of forward propulsion. So yeah. I would, I'll pick random things like that for each and every book that. Yeah. Um, that helps me but then between characters within the booth um it depends a, a lot of i do a lot of dialect work so sometimes it's um it's something that they say within the book that helps me shift to them i'll take a line of their dialogue that makes me uh, that that encapsulates them for me and i will we never stop so it's just that nanosecond that i get to go into their way of of um expressing themselves and it'll it'll tend to be a line of their dialogue Amazing. Michael. Michael, back to you. Back. Yeah, Holst got really angry there for a second. <laughs> uh, Mars came down and smite. No, um, yeah, to get in to get into a kind of an emotional underscoring, but for the most part, it the writing drives the scene. Mm -hmm. Um so it's just it's just follow the writing. Um, you know, and it's 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 open to everything. It's not just the dialogue, sometimes it's a it's a description. How, what's what's you know what choice is it? Scarlet is it? Blood is it? You know what the choice of red that tells me so much. It's a bit like sipping wine, where you're trying to find every little nuance: the cinnamon, the blackberry, the oak, whatever that's been embedded in this uh, in the piece you're working on. I so, think about it so yeah. much as I, I'm the kind of writer I consider myself a cinematic writer, meaning that I actually see the story as a film in my head. And then my job is to transcribe it onto paper so that the exact same film plays in the reader's head. Yeah. And like down to the score and the color palette and the atmosphere and all, and where the camera is moving through. And so- How fast yeah, the I'm camera going, moves, you know, how quickly right? do you cut, do you, do you need to frame the noun right away? So that it's like, that's a jump cut to close up or are we rolling in very slowly across the mountains, down into the road, into the whatever? All of those things, uh, and that's in again. It's it's the text is driving. It's telling you that, uh, yeah. and even uh, it's it's a that, that musical score of okay, I need to like jump cut here, and now I need to like relax into a scene, or I need to go back and forth. 
Yeah, so. well, every score will have, like, as an author, it's a really great hack. It's a great hack because every film score, for instance, will have quiet score, like quiet songs and loud songs and climactic songs and build up songs and denouement songs and they all have different mm -hmm. energy and atmosphere and I think it's one thing that all three of you just do so well is marrying the energy that you bring to a scene to the pace that the scene needs to have. Yeah. Now, it's so interesting to hear you say that um, you know, you're a cinematic writer. Uh, there's a, a scene where a couple of characters are trying to get into a place without an invite and I can see it so clearly in my head you know they're doing the pat down like like distraction and then uh, suddenly you know, I was expecting maybe a punch, but um, <laughs> it's that so clearly in my head. And and what I love about your writing is that the world building is so developed through the characters. So I would love to know um, from your perspective as the writer, how you think about world building through characters. And then um, for the narrators, how that affects you as the narrator, where you're you're responsible through the characters and their voices so much for delivering the world building through inflection. And uh, like Michael, you're very good at having the, um, the not a venom, but like a, a draw to the characters that really like brings so much to um, Cal and Alucard in their own ways. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was a lot of questions for everyone. I'm, I come from what I like to call the anime school of world building. And by this, I mean, in most anime, they don't give you like a pre a prelude they don't walk you into like the once upon a time of the world you really are thrust into a narrative and you learn what you need to know about the world as the characters need to know it and as you're touching it so i always say you don't want to you don't need to the world build a six course meal if a character never eats but i need to choose how to world build based on what's normal to my characters and what's not. So I always think of the very first moment that Kel and Lila go into Red London together. And the reason that I chose to start with Lila's perspective when they're separated is because that is home for Kel. So all of that magic, all of that strangeness, all of that wonder is something he has perceived his entire life and it would feel erroneous for him to notice it. He's going to notice very different things moving through a scene than Lila Bard is who's never been there before. So even reminding yourself that like, even though I'm writing in third person, every scene is attached to a character and that character is going to move through a space and is going to notice different things based on their own life and so I try to world build almost like footsteps where like I want I want it to bloom outward from the character and their movement and as they move through a space I choose world building notes for them knowing that I need my readers to be able to infer everything that I don't tell them from the few details that I do and so I do try to world build very conscientiously so that we're always spreading outward and never getting claustrophobic. I don't design the outer boundaries. I only design outward from the space that we're moving. And so there's what there's reasons that like you won't encounter parts of London in book one. You won't encounter everything because the characters and their stories are expanding outward. And I want it always to feel intimate, whether I'm dealing with big picture, political intrigue, or betrayals, at the end of the day, everything is intimate. Everything is interpersonal. Everything is tiny conflict because that's what we relate to. And the world building has to feel the same way. The world building is intimate. As big, as expansive as this world gets, I always say there's kind of two schools of fantasy. It's major simplification. But like the Tolkien school is a school that you'll never get to access except through the pages of that book. And the Lewis school tells you that somewhere in your house, there's a cupboard with no back and go exploring. And I want to be in that school, right? And so that means that I'm always existing from a point of departure in reality. We're, we're, we're portaling, we have a portal fantasy. So we have our real world and then a departure from it. So that means we're starting with an understanding of reality and building the strange and the new and the wonderful on top of it, not in place of it. And so I try to use a light hand with the world building. I give us what we need, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what we don't need until we actually need it. There was a question yeah. in there. From there. So I will re reiterate it, which is, um, you know, and you guys have talked about a little bit, the very like propulsive nature of the writing and how you guys kind of um, just go with it. So um, hearing what she's just said, uh, does that resonate with you? Um, in, in the way that you read it. Um, yeah. 
Um, hearing you say both the, the things that you've said make perfect sense. The fact that you um, read your work out loud is huge for what we do, but also the fact that every there's always a point of view uh, that you're even in the third person, you're seeing it through their eyes. That makes so much sense because it it um, that it just makes what we do so much easier because I think that the narrative can have as much. Uh, color and richness in how we deliver it as dialogue and as, as character would have so you know you can hear thinking you can hear discovery you can hear all of these things that you put in so what I it, I consider my part of the job of world building you've already done all of it my part is to take the listener on the moment by moment parts of those worlds like you were describing being patted down you can hear that like in the way that you in the way that you describe that action, I think all the action is in that you can hear it in your voice. I think that action sounds different. So I would consider um, part of our job of the interpretation of all of that world building is to is just to make it audible as we will as we walk through that world and discover it. Um, you make it urgent. Yes. So when there's it- urgency. Or where there's like, I love um, stream of consciousness uh, moments where, and again, good writers, you can, as you can predict the number of clauses of thought, because sometimes you're like, you'll, you'll be thinking through this as you see it, as you observe it, as the character is. And with good writers, you you are on that same rhythm with them. With less uh, intentional writing, you've delivered your two, three clauses and you've moved on to another thought and then there's a fourth clause and then you have to go, oh, and that, <laughs> you know. So the, so the good world building is is just the pace of thinking, feeling and moving through the world. That's That would be my interpretation. You guys? I think there's also an interesting aspect of your kind of writing where you say your focus is on the intimacy and what that means is no matter how grand a character is, whether they're a king or a god or or a demon, they are a creature we know intimately. Mm -hmm. And, And so the intention of that character remains alive. I think if you distance yourself from something that is so majestic it cannot possibly be comprehended in a human sense they become flat and uninteresting they're a cardboard cutout whereas if you can always know them intimately you always can get a sense of their intention and that's when they're really frightening yeah yeah that's the thing about Oseron, right? Is that like we work and like I want to make gods have egos and that brings them low, that brings them down. And I think I need everything to be fallible. I don't have no interest in the infallible. It's the reason I don't write omniscience, but I want to be petty on the small. I want everyone to have like petty grievances. Sorry, Michael, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I didn't start. Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, what you said about making to me, what you've done is you've taken the expositional aspect of world building and you've made it uh, integral to what the character is doing. So, for instance, the scene, uh, are, are we spoiling? Maybe I shouldn't do that. Uh, this is the scene, the wedding scene. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, okay, no. so Alakar is looking down at, at the wedding. And so all of a sudden, the room is described because of where he is, which is very important to him. So it's not like... I'm going to tell you what the room looks like. No, he's up here. Why is he up there? Because he has. To, you know, he's looking down. He's been pushed away. So all these. So all the details of that space are not exposition; they're action. Yeah. Um, so that drives the scene, um, and then to, all of a sudden to be like, someone's on the balcony with me. Oh my yeah. god! That becomes something completely different. But that to to make the world building. As you said, mm-hmm. it's revealed by the character in the moment because they need it, and it becomes action. So it becomes drama as opposed to just pure narrative, where I'm, I have a list of facts. Um, and that's you can do that. I mean, that's a different type of, like you said, a different type of, of thing. But this way, it doesn't feel like you don't realize it. You've just given your reader, you know, ten pages of exposition, but it hasn't felt like that. So. Thank you. That's the goal. It's because like, to your point as well before about talking about both of us thinking about lenses and cameras and movement, like I need to have the camera mounted always with the character. 
Mm -hmm. I don't want it to drift away from them. And so I think attention is a thing that I use for exposition, where the character's attention is, because attention is fun, because when you point attention in a direction, it's to the exclusion of something else. So Alucard is standing on that balcony and he's staring down at Rye and Rye's bride, and he's taking in the, the festivities. And it's very important because we're learning about the other royal houses, and this is all very important to the story. So it was exposition we had to get. But by framing it as attention, it's that he doesn't notice the queen coming up next to him. <laughs> And yeah. like, that's important because I think that there's some of the best conflict happens, not like when things are happening a room away, but when things are happening and you just have to catch up to them in that moment, it gives like a very nice whiplash to the character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, V, one of the um, things that is most intriguing about this book is the threads that you pull together, right? You have more characters that we're following. Uh, we're jumping around in time. Is it like a 17 year span between everything or? Seven years between end of Conjuring and start of Threads, but we're also doing some back work as well. Yes, because of Alucard. So what was that process like? And how do you decide, you know, which way to build the tapestry? I'm a ridiculous planner. So I actually build every single scene before I write it, like before I write any of them. So before I sit down to write Threads of Power, I have about 150 scenes that are outlined. I know what the character's perspectives are. And even though the story happens in a narrative order, I write everything in a chronological order. So I go character by character. So Kosika is a great example. The new queen of white London um, starts out when she's seven, takes us all the way to 14. And even though 14 is our current starting point, we're going to go back and we're going to cover the ground in between over the course of the book. But I write her from seven to 14. So, and then I put her, I write her every scene that happens in her voice. And then I put her voice down because I need tiny little minutia details to change in the lexical element in terms of how my characters think, in terms of how long the clauses of their thoughts tend to be. Some tend to have a much more staccato rhythm, some to have a much more stream of consciousness rhythm. And so I want to hold on to the voice, even though I'm writing in third person. And so I will write each and every perspective chronologically and then braid it together into the narrative order, which is daunting. The most daunting aspect of this book, though, was adding new cast to old because not from a technical standpoint, but because I knew that everyone was going to love the old cast more. Because if you've read for, for those who've read Shades of Magic, because there are a contingent of people who are coming in at Threads about, but for anyone who's read Shades of Magic, you have a bias. I mean, these characters have had three books to earn your love and affection. And now I'm bringing in new characters and I did not want the effect of, it's a little bit, people have a trickier time in audio, they can't skim. But like in books, you know, there's always a large cast novel where there's, you're reading it and you're like, oh, I don't care about this character as much. I hope their chapter's short. I didn't want that feeling. Like we just, we care different amounts about different characters. And so weirdly, the thing I had to work on most was investing in Tess and Kosika and Nadia, like these, the effort to make them uh, stalwart enough to stand up against our, our OGs. So that was the most daunting aspect. The rest of it's just technical acumen. I just, am, I'm a little obsessive when it comes to structure. I love playing with it. I have some hard and fast rules about not changing both perspective and timeline. So I can either change timeline within a character or perspective between characters, but I won't jump from past Kel to present Kosika, or from, you know, I, I need to have some kind of continuity. Otherwise, yeah, it's just me getting in my own head. It's hard, I'm not gonna lie. It took a year and a half for the writing itself just to get the it all to work together. <laughs> well, it paid off. Um, and your point, I'm also like, I definitely skipped Sam for those sections in the, the last book of that trilogy that, so I, with audiobooks, you're right, you can't do that. Um, <laughs> it up but you can't skip um but as uh as the narrators did you read it straight through or did you just skip your chapters and just or did you know what was happening in between in the narrative um in the way that v built it sorry um i'm not sure the question. when you when you do your narration do you just read your chapters and i, I can answer i can answer that yeah. um I had, um, I read straight through 
because again, that's that's Fee's intention. So I would like to have the story happen in that way. And we're moving around in time. So it's like, what you know, why are we being told things in the order that we're being told them feels important? And then I don't think about the other chapters. Then I think about the experience of the character, who's my primary point of view. And even though this is third person, it's so well, it, it doesn't feel that way. It feels, it feels pretty personal. Um, but I also had the uh, existing trilogy to um, go back to. So I listened to the whole existing trilogy, but then I started conflating what happened in my, in, in the current book with the old ones. Cause I was, I was listening to them and reading. So then I, um, so then I reread then just Tess's uh, point of view chapters and then had a good sense of at least what was happening to her and would skim read through what was happening to everybody else at the same time. But I think it's, uh, I think it's, Again, it's, it speaks to what Kate was saying earlier. You learn it all and then you forget it all. And then you just play scene by scene, moment by moment. And you just explore it as, as it comes. I think this is one of the challenges of, of multi-narrator audiobooks mm. is that um, you have to read the whole book because you have to know everything that happens. You're responsible only for your sections but your colleagues are also voicing those characters. Everybody has to be on the same page in terms of what that character sounds like, even though the voice is going to sound different because we all have different instruments. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the... When... Okay, so the pre-read is the whole book, and then you get in the booth, and you're just reading your sections. So, yeah, I'm not sitting in the booth reading for a second time a section that I'm not narrating. But sometimes when I flip to the next of my sections, I'll start reading and then I'll be like, wait a minute, what happened? And then I have to go back and kind of like leaf through the section leading up in parts that I know like, what tone does this section begin on? Is this coming out of a, Blah, 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 blah. or is this like right. so you have to know how to marry the like music of the yeah, beginning the of your section because the movement can change yeah i mean that's you know it's a bit like um uh, if 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 the last thing is a cliffhanger or whatever so then how is what's what's the in what is the author's intention for that next section to do to you is it is it going to be to like wake you up because We've just been gentle. Is it to scare you? Is it literally just, okay, the arc has started and now you're continuing it. So you got to start at a higher place than you would normally might think of. So connecting to the beginnings uh, or the ending of the scene before is very important just to know, oh, right, this scene is, you know, it's a, we've changed locations. Okay, this scene is now I'm just, it's the same scene, but it's a different point of view so the camera has just shifted the action is the same in that regard um you, you have to be aware of that um and how your scene fits into the the quilt so to speak of the that that's being formed by this story uh so in that regard i think you do have to you read it just to get a sense of remind yourself oh right this is the action and this is going to the pre-read where what was I doing when I was reading this? Oh my God, I was flipping a page. Or, mm -hmm. no, it stopped. Someone died. Okay, recitative. All right, now we're going to pick up and we're going to we're going to let the action start from the base again. So all those things get get factored into how you uh, marry those things, and that's the thing where you have to trust that the other narrators working on the project are on the same page as you. Can I ask? I feel like. It's it's such an interesting thing to have a, a dynamic where like a, a couple is also reading. Do you have like this luxury where you can, if you knew that like, for instance, Kate, if you knew that like Michael had read the section before you, like, are you only going on text to prepare your section or can, do you hear like this, like an audio snippet that leads into yours? I don't listen to his okay, audio I would unless, I'm, unless I'm checking to okay. hear how he did a particular voice. And not to be crass, but in part, that takes too much time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was super curious because I mean, yeah. you're all recording simultaneously. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, but there's lots of there's lots of open the door of my booth, trot over to his, yeah. knock, knock, knock. Hey, what voice did you give this guy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do it <laughs> well, and there and again, it's because it's different. We have, you know, vastly the three of us have vastly different instruments. It's a bit yeah. like I'm, I'm playing a, a cello and she, she's got a flute and she has a clarinet. Okay. No, I'm okay. more than viola. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, so that's where you, when you describe the character, when you're talking about characters, how do you find a voice? To me, it's finding the essence of the voice. Yeah. Um, what's the what's the one quality, and oftentimes that's an action or it's an attitude that that mm -hmm. person happens to predominantly live with that then forms a tension in their body, and that tension gets carried across three different people, as opposed to. Uh, you know, he's got, a, you know, it's not just typically like a, a bass voice or whatever, or a rumble. It's like, no, he's, he's, he's always impatient. That would, that would be, take me miles down the road in terms of the character, because then all of a sudden there's a whole physicalization that happens. Um, and that's what makes, that's what makes coming back to the voice a lot easier because you've been physicalizing this voice for however many hours you've done. Um, and even if it's been three or four years, all of a sudden you open your mouth and it's like, what? Oh, no, that's not how that person held themselves. And bang, you got it. Okay. Yeah, the mind forgets, the body remembers. remembers. Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. but this is so interesting cool. too, because you voice characters now. Marissa, you're entering in with Tess, but like you two have voiced characters where um, like they've aged now, they've grown up in some ways. I mean, Kel, especially, I think of like has perhaps the most like catastrophic journey from a development from conjuring of light, fragile threads of power because he's had to completely redefine himself. So, you, in some ways, the same question is about like how I built in the time period because I didn't want to have to go back and be the past version of these characters. I wanted them to age with me. But does that create a challenge then? Because you can't. The body remembers the past version of them, but now they're growing a little bit. Is there adjustment or you're just like, I'm in it? We got older too. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Answer is but there is still some of those essential, you know, you can see somebody at 12, you can see them at 17, you see them at 27, you see them at 57 and you go, you know what? Same. It's still... Yeah, yeah, it's still that person. Yeah, when you when you come up with the the um, key elements of a person of a character, I have uh, the way I feel, or at least I still feel like that kid person is better. That is that kid presence is yeah. just very much still there. I've just learned to behave better, or at least mm -hmm. be kinder to myself because <laughs> I I understand why I have the reactions I do. Or but worse, instinct, <laughs> or, right? But the instinct is the same. The character is the same. So I love what you said. Like you've aged. But you're still playing the same character, you know. Yeah. Uh, and also, one of our, one of the things we get all the time is to play characters through one novel who age. You know, I, I had an Austrian queen in a historical fiction that she was. I started her at 15, and she was 62 when mm -hmm. she died. And it was the whole journey and the whole book. And there is there are things that you you very much change about your voice but the characterization doesn't change because the listener has to understand it's the same person mm -hmm. so the listener is relying on you to 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 give an over like a through line of character even though my voice is i'm trying to age my voice and my and all of the other things the driving factors are the same yeah. so i think even though we change on the surface we're just we're reacting to all the same stimuli in hopefully a better way yeah it is so interesting to hear the process behind the art because I think people understand maybe a little bit more what it's like to act, but to act without your body or without people seeing your body. Right. Like clearly, you guys put a lot of your body into the voices, but we don't get to see that. Um, so I'm curious, since some of you have you know um, traditional acting backgrounds, like do you change your approach? Is it the same thing? Just nobody sees, you know, all the grand gestures you're doing or, or what is that difference like? I think it's essentially the same because you're inhabiting a character. It's just how you express it is different because instead of having a 
30 foot by 10 foot stage, 20 foot stage, you're in a four by five booth and you're sitting. So <laughs> there's a lot you can't do. Um, but essentially it's, essentially you are, you are, you're inhabiting that character. The author is another character. So that mm -hmm. third person voice, that's a character. You play, you inhabit the author. And that there, there's a type of theater um, um, that involves narrating a book in which you would read the prose in addition to the dialogue, which is very challenging to do on stage because it is, it feels very unnatural. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in the booth, but it's natural because it's germane to being in the booth making an audio book. Yeah. I, um, oh, sorry. No, no, go, ahead. Go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, firstly, I've heard you're wonderful on stage, Kate. I mm -hmm. um, haven't seen her, but I, I've heard great things. I do stand to uh, narrate. So I move a lot. And as you said, it's quiet clothing. But I think that you hear so much of the physicality. So if the character's pointing, I'm definitely pointing. If... Um, I think it it that's where I get a lot of the pacing from. So um, I remember it, I, there was a scene where a snake was crawling through the character's hands, and the director afterwards told me that I had handled the snake for the entire scene, but I wasn't really aware of it. But I think that there's a different pace if you're if you're looking at something and engaging with something. So I would uh, Kate's done a lot more stage than I have. I would just arguably say that. You bring as much of it in as you can with the awareness that you've only got this distance, that your dynamics have to be slightly compressed, but I still love to shout. I you just I I can't stand when people are like, blah, blah, blah. she shouted. Because <laughs> so, I it can, it, there's way more, there's way more scope, I think, than you than you might initially think. Yeah. So as long as you work with the instrument, which is the mic, and you, you know, there's a lot you can do. In, and, in the physicality. yeah yeah no the it, and the other thing I firmly firmly believe um, is if it's not if, if the images and that could be the physicality of the character it's not living in your mind you're not communicating it you mm -hmm. can't communicate it so if you're describing mountains you know whatever the character who's seeing it has to see those and when you if you're not seeing them as the narrator the audience they're not, is not, they're not there. Is, is yeah. not going to hear. It's not going to see the scene the same way because, like you say, you're handling a snake, so it's it's causing you to do something. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about looking and your eyes are going out there, your mind changes, so your voice changes mm -hmm. because the expanse is there. Mm -hmm. It's not here. It's there, and so your voice automatically makes a, there's a physical adjustment that happens. Uh, and you're not even aware of it, uh, but that won't happen. That's when you get to that rote stage where it's like if you made the decision that no, you have to see the scene for the first time. You have to see that, you know, that door over there where the guy's sitting in the, you know, in the entryway, and what is he doing? And that's always affecting how you're going to relate the scene, whether it's narrative or prose or, or dialogue. So. But it, was, it comes all the way back to how I write it too, because like I, my only philosophy is I can't write what I can't see. It's not write what you know, it's like write what you see in this case, where I have to be able to close my eyes and see exactly what I'm writing. And if I can't visualize it, whether it's realistic or fantastical, I can't write it. And so I have to conjure that imagery. And oftentimes, weirdly, as an author, I'm doing the same thing where I'm like holding space in the same way, or I'm acting something out to make sure I understand how the lifting of this cup would feel and how the eye line of this space. So like, I, I feel like I do a pair, like a, a pantomime of the writing before I write. And then hopefully then, then it's so in funny that at every stage we're having to pantomime for the audience so that they can get there too with us. How many that knives do you and Kate keep around you when you're doing the Lila's sections? Like how many <laughs> 50, minimum 50. There's not a single knife left in the kitchen. They're all with me in the booth. I've got a couple, like, 
uh, questions from the audience or a little rapid fire. So um, this one's for V. If you could do a mega crossover of any of your books, which characters in which worlds would you love um, to have interact? Ooh, I'd put I'd put Luke from The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue in the Shades of Magic world just to see what happens. There's already a god in that world, so I think it would go poorly. But honestly, all of my characters involve some form of supernatural ability, superpower, or magic. I think uh, they they don't play nicely with others, though. So I probably would like avoid a, a tragedy by put keeping everyone in their own world. But yeah, I'd like to see what Luke does with Shades of Magic. He'd create fun chaos. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what is everyone's favorite character, and is it different from the ones that you voiced? I have a favorite. <laughs> well, Tess is my favorite, obviously, because as both those two will attest to, and probably you two, if you, they're all you, they're all yeah. your characters, so you love all of them equally as a mother, I would imagine. Um, uh, so. I I loved any scene that Bex and Kellen came into because I just, firstly, they really up the ante for Tess. So I think that makes really interesting uh, things happen. Uh, you know what? I loved all, I loved all Tess's scenes. So she's my obvious answer, but then Bex and Kellen were fun. And I also, um, I enjoy playing the parts of myself, of all of us that we don't get to give rein to because we're too well behaved. So I love angry characters. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's just being British, but we're, you know, we don't, we don't just say what we think all the time. So when I get characters who just, who just express themselves in this amazing upfront way, I love it because I think you can just inhabit this whole other part of yourself, of the author, of whomever, uh, who's, who's expressing it that you just wouldn't usually get to do. So I had a major soft spot for, uh, for Bex. Yeah. Um, I, I we did a podcast the other day where we had these rapid fire questions and we had to choose favorites and I was a blubbering mess by the end. I can't do it. I cannot <laughs> choose favorite. I just cannot. There, there's like an obvious connection to Lila, mm -hmm. no. but every single character I get to voice is my favorite. Pass on to you. Yeah, no, this is it. There's, <laughs> there's no. Favorite, it's, it's the story, it's the arc, it's the weave that that becomes yeah. uh, so much fun. And uh, you know, there's there's some fun voices sometimes that you get to do that you you don't get to do very often, depending upon the, the work. But that's all. You know, those fun voices wouldn't work without the rest of it there. So uh, you know, uh, there there are lots. There's so many good characters in this, and they're so cleanly drawn that it that no, I don't answer that. <laughs> I will say that Bex is really special to me because Bex essentially could easily be Lila Bard with a different lens on the narrative. Like Bex is oh, cast as sure. we're art because we've already decided to align with Lila. But if we hadn't already decided to align with Lila, it's very much like I have the same theory in my vicious books, which is that like it's not actually hero versus villain. We just pick a side, and whoever's on the opposite side is the villain. And so because we've picked Lila's side. Uh, Bex is inherently her opposite, inherently her villain, but they're essentially the same model. They've just, you know, and that's why my there's a fight scene between Lila and Bex, and it's one of my favorite scenes because I'm like, they're just, it's like that Spider Man picture where they're pointing at each other. I'm like, you guys are the same person in so many ways. <laughs> I, I love Bex and Carolyn's dynamic is so vicious, and I really love it. And everyone shipped it because they're really into like hate mances. And, like, <laughs> hate each other but like they hate each other so openly and honestly and there's something really refreshing about somebody trying to stab you in the front and not the back all the time yeah. Yeah. And, like, and and it's like yeah they're the same they just made different choices so let and that I, be a lesson to you <laughs> exactly exactly and Lila arguably is a little bit of a villain in this book to, to Tess mm -hmm. so I feel like really fun to I think my new moral of the story with threads is that like no one's good or bad right they're just all on their own path um all right, V if you were going to narrate a book what what book would you like to narrate oh my god I am I I love telling stories out loud and I could never narrate anything because I have one voice it is only my voice it's the only <laughs> 
of doing. There's no other voice there. So, you know, I'd love to narrate a children. I'd love to narrate children's books. Like it used to be a thing for me whenever I was stressed with friends, we'd go into a bookstore and we'd sit down in the children's the picture book section. And I would tell them picture book stories. I would I would say them out loud. Uh, and so there's something about the simplicity, not the simplicity from a craft perspective. They're extraordinarily difficult. But there's something about the simplicity of them all feeling like bedtime stories. And I think that's the only voice I have is a bedtime story voice. I mean, there's a lot of children's books out there to narrate. And my kids fall asleep every night to um, like us reading them books, but also like YouTube videos of people reading um kids books with the like the animations say the one that just won the calicot is called hot dog and is so delightful and i got to see the artwork for it before there was text and so i narrated it to my friend uh like when there was no text so i made up all the text while with just the pictures and so i essentially got to narrate something that didn't exist and that was the most fun I've ever had. Like, I love to narrate a picture book. Now it has text and the text is wonderful too. Give <laughs> me a picture book and I'm just in my happy place. All right, last question um, before the final wrap up question. What audiobook speed do you listen at if you listen to audiobooks? And what audiobook speed is too fast that upsets the narrators? I'm not going first. Anything above one? I. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> okay. That, I listened to yeah. 1.5. I think oh, one. that's that's fast. What did it you say? It goes up to like three. What did you say? I said 1.5. Here's what I'll say. I it if I'm listening to nonfiction, it's at like 1.7. If okay. I'm listening to fiction, I know look, Kate's face is distressing. It's we'll say 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> like 1.4 but it really depends on the narrator um and like nothing against against the extraordinary michael kramers of the world i tend to speed up men's voices a little bit more than i speed up women's because i think that there is like it, not not for you obviously i would never speed up my own audiobooks. Uh, <laughs> like i i would say that 1.25 to 1.5 Five is usually the zone I'm in, unless I'm trying to blitz through a nonfiction or I'm doing research or something, and then it's usually around 1.7. That feels well, different. That I find this question so fascinating because um, obviously from, from the perspective of a narrator, we're the typesetters, yes. right? We decide how long a pause is until the post-production comes in and goes, chop that. Um, but we determine the shape of the sound. So for someone to speed it up is taking away my agency for my craft. Yeah. My other question is, this is a multiple question thing. When you watch a film, do you submit to the choices that were made by the film director or do you increase the speed of the film? I'm not going to let you answer just yet. And the other thing is the difference between watching a film and listening to an audiobook, neural pathway brain wise is extremely different. And for a lot of people, they cannot listen at regular speed. They cannot take in what's being said if it's being played at regular speed. But there are things you can do. You can knit. You can occupy your hands. A lot of the time, if you are actually using your body to do something, then you can absorb the audio at regular speed. So those are my feelings and thoughts and questions about this slightly touchy subject. No, it's very valid though, because I say as like an author, I'll find people will read the ending first or they'll read pieces of like, <gasps> Yeah, they do. <laughs> level of anger or like people will skim or people will skip some. So I understand that there's an intentionality that like, and, and, I, and I, I lashed out on a, on, a, on a book event because somebody in the audience admitted to reading the ending first. And I said, that every order that I set every chapter is with intention. So to your point, Kate, I have chosen exactly the way in which I want you to read the book. So reading the ending first is ruinous because I did not put that ending first. I put the ending last. 
And I will 100% admit that oftentimes when I'm speeding up a book, it's in some way because I don't feel aligned with the narrator. Mm-hmm. In some way, I feel like the narr- I, I don't usually do it if I'm in love with the, the narration. But if I feel like the narrator perhaps is more of a, a rote experience or more of a like monotonous tone, or I don't feel like they're creating a film for me, I don't feel like they're creating an experience, which is obviously what brilliant narrators do, then I'm reading for work or I'm doing something where it is work and not pleasure, those are the times when I find myself speeding it up. But you're absolutely right in that you've made intentional choices with the narration that then doing anything to disrupt it. I mean, when I saw that they added a speed up button on like Netflix for TV, I was like, why would you do that? You can put it up to twice as fast. You can put the speed up on the TV to twice as fast. Well, I I will make one comment with regard to speed. I mean, actually two comments. One, uh, as you pointed out, sometimes people process things differently at different speeds. So just like uh, it takes me, you know, a minute to read the page, she's, you know, on page three, just bang, 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 bang. And it takes me a longer time to do that. I sing and tempo, you can sing the song at this tempo and you can sing the song at that tempo and you can sing the song at that tempo. And the song, to what degree does it change? Uh, partly depends on your mood, especially when it gets into the more sentimental world. Uh, so it can be, sometimes you want that speed and it needs to be, and hopefully the narrator has captured that speed, but also you might not be as a listener in that place, the same place. So, and, or is there that much difference between, you know, something at 97 as opposed to 79, as opposed to 65? Uh, so I, I, you know, the, when the, when the speeding up totally destroys the pacing, you're still going to get the pacing. You're just going to get it in a more, uh, allegro fashion. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so in that regard, uh, the bigger thing is listen to enjoy. So whatever you need right. to, do to, to enjoy, do it. I'm one of those people who can't, uh, like my mind wanders if there's the spacing between words being said. So speeding it up helps me stay focused on what's actually being Dark said. Knitting. I, you know, my knitting, everyone stopped wanting all these hats that I was making. So I, yeah, yeah. I expect one. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So we, I've enjoyed this conversation so much. It is so exciting to be able to here, not only from the author, but from the narrators of a book that I absolutely love and a series that I love. So thanks for staying with me a little extra longer. I really wanted to ask the speed question, but I didn't want to sour at the beginning of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to hear um, from V and from everyone else. What are you guys working on now? Ooh, I'm like way more curious about the narrators. <laughs> Marissa? Uh, I have... Uh, I'm a historical fiction girl, so I have um, quite a few. I have, I dip, I rarely make it to modern times. I'm dipping into the Cold War next week. Uh, Then I do have a mystery thriller, which is a departure for me. So that's fun. Um, And then I go back to 1940 and I have a a detective. um, Yes, a little lady detective working in 1940 on behalf of the uh, British government. So that's what I, and I'm also writing an audio play. Ooh. Because I love to write and I I love to, um, I love the scope that our industry has, that I don't know it gets explored enough. I love the idea of putting actors in the same room. We don't get to do that very much. So because we've got all these wonderful colleagues and I these are the people I know and I can find space and put everyone in a room together in a couple of places in New York City, that is what's ha- uh, that is what I want to do next, my, my audio play. I'm waiting for... Um, for you to write another book that you will let any one of the three of us go. <laughs> so, um, uh, Michael and I just had a meeting where we plotted out the work that we have lined up for a, a, an extraordinary number of months. I'm not even going to say how many. And there are a number of series and there are a number of different genres and about Half the work is with um, Mm -hmm. independent authors who are self-publishing their audiobooks. 
and they're all over the map. Some of them are series, some of them are one-offs, fiction, fantasy, non-fiction, all kinds of different things. And they all need a different level of uh, walking through the process. Some are very experienced and they're like, yep, just give me the audio files. I know what I'm doing. And the others are like, how do I do this? So that's a big part of, of what takes up a lot of my time. Um, the book that I'm working on right now, okay. I am self-producing a public domain book of Jane Austen's letters. Oh, through hey. Spoken Realms. We've done three books via Spoken Realms that we have self-produced. The Prophet, Zane Grey's Wanderer of the Wasteland, and Lytton Strachey's biography of Queen Victoria. And the reason I'm doing this book is that the woman who runs the print shop that does our merch got a message from someone who was like messaging her, thinking they were messaging me. And the message was, you need to narrate Jane Austen's letters, period, and his message. <laughs> and so my, my lovely merch lady contacted me and said, Here, I think this message is for you. And I was like, ha ha, get right on that. And then I was like, oh, that's public domain. I could do it. So I've made an ebook that's a companion to the audio book. And I am recording the audio book. She is so devilishly funny there is a there is a two sentence paragraph in one of her letters where she basically says mrs so-and-so was brought to bed of a stillborn child last week owing to a severe shock i suppose she happened to look at her husband unawares <laughs> <laughs> oh dear yeah uh, i have a bunch of projects kind of up in the air. I'm in the middle of doing uh, a nonfiction book called The Pink Triangle, which is about uh, Claude Vidal, uh, Tennessee Williams, and Truman Capote, and basically kind of the, the backstory behind all of the stuff that they were doing. That's for the Library of Congress. That's for, right? that's for the Talking Books program. I'm also doing a, a classic 1920s uh, detective story called The Canary Murder Case. Uh, uh they're reissuing that and then i've got uh two series going uh corrections to do for uh, a new sci-fi you know uh galactic war series and then i'm in the middle of uh a fantasy series the the first book of a fantasy series um, uh for uh Athon. so and then we have our list of many months of other things <laughs> It's what's great, like you say, is the breadth of the of the industry. Um, uh, uh, we do. I mean, we end up doing predominantly the uh, fantasy, but it's great when you move off and do a, a thriller or do some nonfiction and stuff. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, amazing. Well, I'm hard at work on a few books, but the next Threads book, obviously, and because there's three of them and i'm also working on my next standalone novel so i had abby larue as my last standalone novel and my next one is um i can't reveal the title yet but i like to call it toxic lesbian vampires it's a very much like yes, <laughs> personality tale uh about hunger and rage and it's about three women uh over the course of 500 years with their lives and deaths and lives again intertwined and so that will be the next i know marissa there's definitely sign me up <laughs> there's definitely a character for you um three women three voices almost i like to call it three novellas in a trench coat uh because it's kind of its own structure uh and then the third and final book in my villain series and so it'll alternate so my toxic lesbian vampires and then threads two and then the third book in the villain series and then threads three so. So much, good, so much good stuff yeah. to look forward from all of you. Um, but I think we'll have to wrap it up here. If you have not bought Fragile Threads of Power, what are you doing? But also, <laughs> buy Fragile Threads of Power. If you want to buy it from Mysterious Galaxy, we do, I believe, still have some of um, the special collectible art that you couldn't get if you put in the order comments that you want the collectible artwork. Don't quote me if I'm wrong. I apologize. I haven't heard whether we do actually still have some, but so limited chance, but do please buy it. And if you want to listen to the audio book version and you want to support independent bookstores, check out Libro.fm. 
Um, you get all your audiobooks there and, and listen to them. And you can choose a independent bookstore to support in your area. Um, so it's a great app and a great way to listen to all these um, audiobooks that Marissa and Kate and Michael are narrating. Amazing. Thank you so much. And also, thank you for this opportunity. It's I get to nerd out. Like, this is not a thing authors get to do very often, to nerd out over the So it's very, very special. Thanks. So thank you. Yeah, super Thanks exciting. Um, thank you, everyone who was in the audience and watched. And uh, with that, we will say good night or good afternoon. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.